All right. Well, Gary, I am so excited to have you here. I'm excited to dive in with you and just connect and learn so much from you. And so thank you for jumping on the podcast. Yeah. Thanks for having me. It's really a pleasure to be here. Yeah. So I know today we're going to get into a lot in regards to, you know, sex trafficking and the world and what it looks like and why we need to know about it and what we can do about it and like all of those sorts of questions. But let's just start out and like kick it off. Like tell us a little bit about you and your family and how you guys got involved and so passionate about it and your kind of your backstory. Yeah, thanks. So we, you know, I, I wouldn't consider myself a, a huge social activist uh, that's been involved with nonprofits for, for a long amount of time. But a couple years ago, we ran into a documentary called Operation Toussaint, and it's on Amazon Prime. It's, it's free with Prime to watch. And it really told this story about human trafficking here in the U.S., human trafficking abroad, and a particular organization that's doing something about it, Operation Underground Railroad. And we were captivated. Um, it's it's not always the brightest topic to talk about. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, you know, I've witnessed through different presentations and, and just discussing with audiences, you can actually visibly see people kind of shifting in their seats uncomfortably when you start talking about this this topic. It's something that a lot of people know about. They know it exists, but they they are shocked to find that it's so prevalent here in the US, it's so prevalent abroad. It's the fastest growing enterprise, uh, criminal enterprise in the, in the history of the world. So uh, we'll get into some details of that, I'm sure later on, but you know, specifically for, for us, we were just lit on fire for, for this cause. Uh, we couldn't forget about it. We made all our friends watch that documentary and we even started doing lemonade and hot chocolate stands in our neighborhood just to create awareness about this issue. And uh, we were even able to raise a little, a little bit of money, like a little bit of money and send it over to Operation Underground Railroad a couple of years ago. So we started kind of formulating this plan to uh, work remote and travel around the U.S. and do this thing, donuts, hot chocolate, coffee, lemonade at churches and different organizations. And we were gonna kind of do this as a family. And lo and behold, uh, just this year, I was just scouring over uh, LinkedIn and I noticed that Operation Underground Railroad was looking for a development manager. I've spent about 10 years in the for-profit space. I worked in healthcare administration as a practice manager. I worked in healthcare software as a chief operating officer of a startup in Austin. And some of my role was investor relations and, and fundraising. So there were some similarities there and I jumped at the opportunity and now here we are a few months later and we were going, our plan was to travel and raise awareness. And now to be able to do that in an official capacity is just kind of a dream come true. So we're still pinching ourselves a little bit uh, at this opportunity, but uh, you know, my family and I, we shipped up to Utah on March 2nd, just before all this craziness with COVID. And I started onboarding and learning with the company. And now here we are a few months later, and we're actually going to continue our travels around the U.S., but we're trying to create more awareness in some other states. We're Utah-based, and we have a lot of following and influence in Utah, some in Southern California, and a little bit in North Texas. But other than that, there's not a lot of folks who are aware of our organization around the U.S., and so we hope to change that this year and, and continue to uh, spread the message about the 2 million children in the world right now that are stuck in the throes of sex slavery. And, you know, my, my role is to, uh, is to do that, do, you know, opportunities like this, uh, by the way, thank you for opening us up to your audience and allowing us to have this discussion, but opportunities like this to raise awareness and then also hopefully to raise funds to continue doing what we're doing. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so, and it's so I, 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 funny, like you mentioned like this year and like what a powerful year for you to be like this beyond mission for this year. And I recently was just thinking about it and I was thinking about the way our world has been this year so far feels like we're a caterpillar stuck inside a cocoon and you know what life looked like before feels like now it's all dark and closed off and we don't know what's happening we don't know what the future holds but i have this like strong hope that as a world and as a country we're going to morph out of this into something more beautiful so I'm excited to have you and, and like your mission and your organization and your vision and all of that be a part of where I think that's headed. So I'm excited for that. So 
I, I think it's so powerful. And I think that, like you said, it's hard when you listen to a story and you listen to what's going on around the world to not feel moved in some capacity. So what does it look like around the world in terms of trafficking? I know, like you mentioned already, like it was news to you that it's so much in our own backyard, like that it's here. And I know there's been more publicity about it a little bit, but I think there's still parts of the country that maybe haven't heard about it at all. So give us just kind of, or even the world, like I have worldview listeners. So like, what does it look like in the United States particularly, or, and then outside in kind of more of those like first world countries? And then what does it look like in other countries as well? Yeah. So, um, you know, we operate in 27 countries around the world uh, and we operate in 25 states here in the U.S. And uh, a lot of people are surprised to learn that 30 to 40 percent or so of the operations that we run are actually right here in the U.S. So I heard a statistic recently. This, this is new information, but um, within 48 hours of a teen running away from their home, a third of them are solicited for sex within 48 hours. So uh, the reality is, is that there are certain individuals that are manipulative and crafty and, and they um, have a way of attracting vulnerable teens and young kids into this life. And it doesn't always look like Taken, right? If you've mm -hmm. seen that movie or, or some, mm -hmm. some of the big blockbuster movies, what it looks like is uh, a vulnerable teen who's just gone, boys and girls, who've just gone through a breakup, uh, they're feeling down on themselves, and all of a sudden in comes this predator online and starts showering them with attention and, and, um, and encouragement. And all of a sudden, you know, they're, they're sort of pulling them away from their family, they're isolating them from their family and friends, uh, they're, you know, we've all been teens and, and there's, there's uh, naivety there and you don't understand everything about, you know, people's yeah. intentions and things like that. Uh, and all of a sudden, you know, you snap one picture, one bad decision, and that's what grips you into that lifestyle because they threaten to let everyone know, they threaten to let your family know, th these predators do, and all of a sudden this teen is trapped in the situation. So the average child in sex slavery is 13. And it's a $150 billion industry. Uh, people ask us, you know, why, why is the demand so prevalent? Why, why, why does it exist so much? And it's just money. I mean, you can sell a bag of cocaine once. You can sell a child five to ten times a day for however long they're, they're in that industry. And mm -hmm. the gravity of that is gripping to think about. I mean, it's yeah. a heinous, heinous crime. And, and they are literally living in hell on earth. I mean, it, it is it is the mo the darkest thing that you can imagine, the darkest corner of of humanity, and you. I love the paradigm that you alluded to earlier when you're talking about um, hope, hope for the future, hope for these kids, and you know we have operators around the world that that literally have to pretend like these monsters that want to hurt kids in order to gain evidence, in order to liberate these children. And I'll talk a little bit about our process here on here on this discussion. Um, but the point I wanted to make is that as an organization, we also like to focus on the hope and the light of what we're doing, that we're actually liberating these children from, you know, the, the darkest corner of humanity, putting them in an aftercare setting to start their healing journey. So a lot, a, anyone that knows Operation Underground Railroad, a lot of people that know us know us for our rescue missions, and we certainly do that. But it's it's at least it, it as important, if not more important, that that we focus on the aftercare side as well. So we actually mm -hmm. won't perform an operation, we won't liberate children until we have a vetted aftercare facility that can that can provide for them through adulthood, that can feed them, that can provide them educational resources. And as an organization, we fund all of that process as well. So we stay with those kids all the way through adulthood. And there's story after story after story of, you know, children adopting this new way of life or even being adopted since we're on that topic. Uh, there's an arm of our aftercare that actually puts, puts children in, in safe homes so that they can heal there as well. And, uh, and that's, that's what we focus on. That's what's really important to us because we say that, you know, unless, unless a child is, is healed, they're, they're not really fully rescued. And that's mm -hmm. absolutely a, a part of what we do. So we've been around for about six years. We were founded by a gentleman by the name of Tim Ballard. If, 
uh, if we don't have time to talk about his story, that's a story in itself. It's, it's amazing. Uh, I would just encourage everybody to, to take a look at that documentary, Operation Tucson. Check out our website and you can find out more about that. Um, but to date, we've rescued over 3,600 survivors around the world. And we've arrested, assisted in the arrest of over 2,000 traffickers and predators as well. So uh, those are just some, some latest statistics uh, yeah. for what we're doing around the world. Yeah. And I think it's so amazing. And I think that there is so many layers to it. I think like what you said, most people would think like, oh, it is just about rescuing and pulling them out of that. And it's so much more than that. Like the psychological ramifications and like what we're setting those kids up for if we don't do that healing process, I think is really powerful. Just out of curiosity, do you find like some of the kids that are here in the U.S., <clears throat> Are they more kids that have run away from home or are they kids that have been, that have gone missing? Do they ever get reunited with their prior family or is that not usually part of what happens? Yeah. So, um, particularly here in the U S uh, we, you know, the goal is always reunification if mm -hmm. that's possible, um, around the world, it, it gets a little bit tricky in some situations. There are certain cultures where, uh, trafficking kids is is prevalent even generationally and and so sometimes their families are involved in putting that in in that situation to, right. to make funds and income for for the for the family and so it's it's really not possible right, for right. us to reunite or we wouldn't want to do that um, but there is a, a recent story uh, of an individual who was in the Middle East and she was separated from her family and uh, one of the things, we have some sister organizations that work with displaced refugees. Uh, and, and so we were, we were in line with them, OUR was in line with them doing some missions with them. And so we were, we were trying to uh, get individuals out of the way of, of ISIS. Um, ISIS come through and they just pillage, uh, they pillage cities and it, it creates a, a breeding ground for trafficking situations and, and other heinous crimes, as, mm -hmm. as you can imagine. And so we're involved with some sister organizations that actually proactively get those individuals out of harm's way. And this is a situation like that, but the mother and the daughter got separated. Uh, and the mother actually received information in that her daughter had been killed. And so she was displaced to another country over a decade later um we actually found we found the daughter and she was she was alive she had been trafficked uh she had been in and around these these isis circles and 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 being used unfortunately but we were able to liberate her out of that situation and actually reunite her with her mother in another country and our our uh, our founder and our ceo were actually able to hand deliver her to her mother it was it was such a such a powerful story but um and you can we there's a, a couple of uh of, of videos on, on YouTube that you can take a look at as well um, on our Operation Underground Railroad YouTube page and you can you can see that re reunification story but it's situations like that that just give mm -hmm. us so much hope for the future and we we often say this as an organization if it was just for the one it would be worth it all yeah. of this would be worth it you know the, all the staff we have all the operators we have around the world and thankfully we've, we've been able to to rescue and, and liberate more than one but that that's our focus just the, the next individual who we can bring out of that situation yeah yeah 100 percent. i think it's kind of that that philosophy that mindset of like just that what's the next right step like what's that next ch one child not the, I mean, yes, we have these grand big visions, but sometimes those grand big visions feel so hard and overwhelming, but like, what's that one right next step that I can do? Um, I know you mentioned kind of, we talked a little bit about different countries and I'm just kind of curious in light of everything that's happened in the United States with racial separation and stuff, do you notice that there's a difference in the numbers of people that are trafficked based on race? Yes, um, somebody who is uh, more more involved in the statistics than I am could probably answer that question more accurately. Yeah. There is certainly disparity there. I don't know all of the details of it, but I do know that um, impoverished communities and uh, communities at risk are certainly more vulnerable for this. Uh, mm -hmm. We see that in in the stats, and so however that is displaced between race, I'm sure would it would affect that as well. But um, I don't want to sort of overplay that hand because uh, it, it really is prevalent amongst all races and it's prevalent in, in every community. And, right. and uh, that, that's the reality of it. Right, 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 right. 
Okay. So, I, I mean, I know we've talked, we've circled and we've talked a lot about it. What is something that like a listener, somebody that's listening in and tuning in that like you were able to take this beautiful story of like listening to a documentary and then see it f- come full circle where that's like your, you know, your job and your profession and your vision and your goal right now. But for somebody else that's listening, that wants to take action, wants to do something, they just need to know like, what's that right next step? Like what's something that they can do? We have some resources on, on our website. That's the first place that I, I always want to direct somebody is that if, if it is something that, that stirs your heart, uh, which I see over and over again, uh, you know, just educate yourself, you know, use that motivation and that momentum to, to learn more about the, the situation at hand. Uh, we have a, a training course where you hear from some of the leaders of our organization on know the signs of trafficking. So they'll walk you through uh, what it's like to be trafficked, what what individuals are targets for that, what you can do about it in your community. I always love telling the story. There's an individual who went through that training. She was on an airplane and she noticed a situation that just seemed off. And she was able to sort of, you don't want to alert uh, you don't want to make make the child feel like they're at risk, and you also don't want to alert whoever is is with them that you're trying to communicate with them. So she she found a way to discreetly just ask the child if 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 she was okay, and she just shook her head no. And so she was actually able to notify authorities, and that child was removed from that situation. It's such a great story, but yeah. uh, if if it's happening, it, it is. But let's say hypothetically, it's happening in in your community. And you notice something and you've gone through that training, you know exactly the next steps to take to, to, to take care of that situation safely um, and make sure that the child is actually removed from the situation. So uh, that, that would be step one in my mind. We also have uh, more information on, on the site. It's called Join the Fight. It's, a, it's one of the tabs on our site. And there's so many things to do there. So you can, you can start a fundraiser in your community, start a 5K, uh, do hot chocolate and lemonade stands if you want to, like like we did. Um, you can also become a volunteer. So we we call it our our small army. Uh, we have ten thousand volunteers across the U.S. and it is such a an amazing group to be a part of. There's Facebook groups even geographically across the U.S. and different ways that those guys connect. And we have an amazing director of of outreach and our volunteer department who is always providing opportunities for our volunteers to get involved. So I would really encourage that as well. Uh, finally, we have what we call our abolitionist club. So these are individuals who have, who have taken the stand to give a, a monthly recurring donation. We have $1 monthly donations and we have up to $1,000 monthly donations. And what we really care about as an organization is the commitment, not the amount, right? So mm-hmm. uh, we're really grateful for that group. And <clears throat> surprisingly, they support almost 40% of all of our operations, our, our monthly recurring donors. So uh, educate yourself, get involved. There's lots of ways to do that on the website. And if you have the means, please support our operation because I always tell people that, um, you know, we, we have thankfully, we have amazing, educated, experienced law enfor- ex-law enforcement officials and ex-military uh, individuals who have established an infrastructure that safely rescues these kids and puts them in aftercare. And so um, that, that money is so efficient in our hands and we know exactly what to do with it to liberate these children. And another thing that I always mention, and actually this is something that I vetted and found out before I came on the organization because you always wanna know okay, you know, is, is my donation going towards administrative overhead? Like how much of it is actually bottom line going to rescue these kids? Mm -hmm. And this is an incredible statistic. I was like, I'm sold. I'm in, let me be a part of it. But 85, over 85% of, of the money that we receive in donations goes directly towards operations in aftercare. So we're incredibly lean and efficient and we, we try to do everything we can to make sure that that money is directly influencing the the situation at large. Right. Yeah. 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 And I think that like you, even going back to what your story at the beginning about, you know, when you guys heard about this, like your kids were in your family, you were out there doing lemonade stands and things like that. And I think that that's such a powerful way that we can incorporate our kids and help our kids be raised with this mentality of looking for the world, like looking at the world and bringing our attention and bringing our awareness to things that are in need and how can they make an impact? Like I want my kids to know 
that they can make an impact, even if they're only six and seven years old or whatever age they're at, you know, and that it doesn't have to be only adults making an impact, but that kids can do that too. And I think that when we start to instill them that sort of vision from the very beginning, that they will be the people that carry forward and create massive change in the world. Um, they're going to just like stand on our shoulders as we go. But I think it's really powerful to look at this as a whole family sort of thing too. And just that education, is there kind of going off that, is there education that we should be doing with our kids to help protect them from becoming a part of this sort of a uh, situation? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, one, one benchmark that we kind of kick around as an organization, because m- many of us have kids, obviously, and it's like, you know, we were engulfed in these stories and mm-hmm. at work and, and we're thinking about them and thinking about strategies and how to do things more efficiently. And then we come home and it's like, you know, it's, it's sort of this dichotomy of, of lifestyle because thank God our kids are, are healthy and safe and, and growing and getting the, the nourishment emotionally and, and physically that they need. Whereas these kids that we're working with is it, the complete opposite. Yeah. And a sort of a benchmark that we use, um, which my kids are so young, so I don't I haven't had to really make this decision yet. Um, you know, but a benchmark we use is the, the age of a kid that's experiencing this in the world uh, is is perhaps the age you should use for your kids to start fostering those conversations. Mm. Um, and obviously that is, I'm not going to even give any more advice about that because that is a, a family by family discretional decision, Yeah, but it is something to consider. And I, I love what you said about basically our ceiling is their floor, right? We just want to empower them and, and educate them and, and demonstrate to them that they actually can have an influence and make a difference. And, you know, I just love how kids embrace it. They just, mm-hmm. they embrace that, that opportunity, at least, at least in my experience. And, um, and yeah, I think that's really important to foster those conversations. Another component of that is, is, you know, uh, my wife and I often talk about how are we going to protect our kids from, you know, the world out there. I mean, we always say that they're just two, three clicks away from someplace on the internet that, that would be harmful to them. Yeah. And, you know, we're not the helicopter parent type, um, but we definitely see the importance of fostering communication and having transparency with what your kids are doing online. So there's lots of tools for that, um, which, which I encourage uh, everyone to do their own research on that. But I think probably the most important piece of that is connection and fostering communication and, and transparency. And as they come of age, just make them aware that there are things that, that can hurt them and, and harm them. Um, and you have, to, you have to help them learn that early on where the consequences are, are, are less intense, right? Mm-hmm. So um, as they get older, the stakes are higher, the consequences are more. And so, you know, have that conversation early and, and, and have it often and do it because you love them right? And you want them to be safe. I know it's uncomfortable and it can be challenging, but you know, the, um, the, the reality of them falling into a situation like that is, is much more harmful and and challenging than, than not. So I I say it's, it's worth it. That's my two cents on, on the matter. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I always felt like we'd done a pretty good job of communicating, you know, what you do and don't share on the internet until this whole distance learning thing started. And I realized how very quickly my kids are very click happy on the internet. So whether it's actually something like this or just a virus on the computer or whatever, like they will click on any ad or anything that pops up. And I'm like, no, you cannot do that. So I think it's brought like distance learning is definitely brought up a lot. And even inside like my daughter's group of her classmates, you know, people were talking about like, well, where do you live? Where do you live? And just that, you know, I, at one point I saw her teacher turn off the whole thread and delete it and all and saying like, you need to talk to your parents about like online safety. And, and it realized like that all these kids were sharing with their addresses in a very, what they thought was a safe place to do that, but not realizing the bigger ramifications of that and just like that stuff that you don't share online. So I think it is really important, especially who knows what the world is going to look like in the fall and into the next year of school, if there's going to be more distance learning, if our kids are on the computers more and how it's such a powerful conversation we need to have. Yeah, that's a, that's a great tip. It's, um, you know, they're, they're so innocent and, and just so ready to communicate and, and socialize and, and be open about information, which I, I love that. I love that yeah. innocence. Um, but yeah, I think, uh, I, 
think it's an opportunity to instill a little bit of wisdom in them as well. And, and uh, it sounds like you were aware of them <laughs> clicking on those things, which means that you were present and around. And I commend you for that. I know that's hard to do, uh, you know, living a balanced lifestyle between work and, and being at home. So, uh, but it's important and it's, it, it's, it's so worth it. It's so worth it. Yeah. All right. Well, we have talked about a lot. Is there any last thing that you want to cover before we let people know where they can find you? Yeah. So I just wanted to mention that, um, you know, we also work with corporations, we work with partnerships. And if you're involved with a company, if you're an influence at a company, I'd love to, to talk more about how we can collaborate. Uh, we love working with companies and, and creating events and, and doing press releases and, and shared marketing events. Um, we're really thankful for those companies that have, have stepped out and, and made a difference for us as an organization and, and obviously toward, towards the cause. And so if that's something that, that sparks interest in you, please feel free to reach out to me. You can find us at, on the website, obviously, uh, specifically info at ourrescue.org. If it's a, a corporate partnership or something that you're interested, you're welcome to email us at partnerships at ourrescue.org. Find us on Instagram at OURrescue. Find us on Facebook at OURrescue. We're in all of those places. And I think um, at least what's encouraging to me is that we have an amazing marketing team that's always doing their best to pull these stories from the operators and share them uh, to, to the general public so that everybody can kind of keep up to speed on, on what it is that we're doing. And the last thing I want to mention is that there's really two groups that I want to uh, honor in this conversation. I'm thankful that I get to sit here and, and talk to you all about this organization. But the reality is, is that it's only possible because of our faceless and nameless operators that are around the world. Uh, we have two operators that are stuck in a country right now that can't even leave. And yet they're using their time to uh, get on the internet and try to find predators and, and, and traffickers online as well. So um, the, m many of them probably wouldn't even want the opportunity to talk to the audience because that's just yeah. the kind of people that they are. They don't want that recognition. Um, but I do, do, do want to take a minute because they're risking their lives, they're risking their safety to go into the belly of the beast, so to speak and gather evidence you know they have hidden cameras on them they don't they're not armed and so they're walking in this the snake pit really and and if one thing goes wrong they could lose their life and that mm -hmm. that's the reality of what they're doing but they're doing it because they know that children are living in hell on earth and they need to be liberated so i just want to honor that that group around the world uh, and also our survivors, um, you know, what, what they've experienced and what they've gone through. And they have an incredible and challenging journey ahead of them to heal. But they're so courageous and brave for embracing that and, and making the best of it. I, you know, I could go on and on, but I, I do want to direct people just, just to our, our content because we have blogs, we have videos, we have articles about all these survivors and the things that they're doing with, with this yeah. new life, this new lease on life that they've been given. And it's really encouraging to, to witness and, and to read about. So I encourage everybody to take a look at that. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate that. And I love that you've shared and I would highly encourage people just to go over there and check it out, see what it's all about, see if it's something, if this episode really spoke to you. I mean, I feel like this has been something that's been speaking to me for a very long time, but it maybe is totally new to a lot of people. So if this touched on you at all, just, I encourage you to dig in and find out more information and research a little bit more, um, do that next right step. That's good for you. So thank you so much, Gary, for coming on and sharing and just, yeah, being a part of the vision and being part of that hope and that journey. So I appreciate it. it. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Let's see. I can pause here.